mighty, amen? Mighty to do whatever we need done. As I began to think about the last Sunday of the year, which today is that last Sunday, I began to think about what it is that we need to be challenged for this next year in the Lord. You know, time really doesn't stop. It's just our calendar reflects the stopping. But then that our calendar reflects the stop, I think we need to be challenged directly. What is it? And I asked the Lord, what is it that would be the most important thing for us to be challenged by, by this next year? And I came across a story about a couple who had left the city to move to the country. And as soon as they got to the country, of course, they were city slickers. They had always heard about duck hunting. And so they thought, you know what? One thing we want to try now that we're out in the country is to duck hunt. And so somebody told them, if you're going to duck hunt, you need to get a duck hunting dog. And so they did. And the first time they went out duck hunting, they killed zero ducks. Next time they went out duck hunting, zero ducks. Third time they went out duck hunting, zero ducks. So the husband tells the wife, said, you know what? We're going to come out here tomorrow and we're going to throw that dog higher than we've ever thrown him before and we're going to get some ducks. It reminds me of what people do with New Year's resolutions. The issue's not trying harder or throwing it up higher. The issue's doing something totally different. Because you can throw that dog all year long in 2015, but he's not going to get any ducks. Maybe you need to read the instructions and to see something different that you didn't do in 2014 that God would lead you to do in 2015 that's a little different. And I believe that uh, the Lord had drawn me to Matthew chapter 9 for the two words that I believe are going to be our challenge, uh, hopefully will be our challenge for the new year. And they are following Jesus. It sounds simple, but isn't that what we should be doing? Following Jesus. That should be our goal for the whole year of 2015 and really till we go to see the Lord should be our goal. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9 to see the facets of following Jesus. First of all, the motivation for following Jesus, which is always grace. I may add mercy. Our motivation for following is grace. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collector booth. And we'll see that he tells him later on, follow me. Follow me. But we look at who it is that he asked, and it was Matthew. And we already see what he does for a living. He is a tax collector. Now, if you think the IRS is looked down upon these days, n not near as much as tax collectors in Jesus' day. These people were viewed as the most vile, corrupt people in the society. They were ranked right there with unclean animals. So if you're a tax collector and you're an unclean animal, you had the same social status. Oh, these people were despised. They most of the time were cheats because you really bought a franchise when you bought a tax collector booth. You could get any money additional to what the, was owed the Romans. If you collected extra, that money went to you. So there was always the temptation to gouge the people. They would also take bribes from the wealthy so they wouldn't have to pay quite as much tax. So the Romans, they didn't like them because they were Jews. The Jews didn't like them because they were tax collectors. You really narrowed down the people that you could really hang with. You couldn't hang with the religious. You couldn't hang with the people of your group. It kind of narrowed you down because you were so despised. Remember, in fact, Jesus, remember we talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector went to the temple. Remember the, tax, the Pharisee began to list the people that he thanked God that he was not like. And one of them was, thank God I'm not like that tax collector right there. Oh, boy, to, to be him, that would be awful. Of course, Jesus went on to say it was that tax collector who beat upon his chest and said, ask for mercy. And that man went home justified. But we can see how these people viewed themselves. If they viewed themselves the way society viewed them. Now, we don't know that Matthew would have had any contact. Obviously, he wouldn't have in the temple because he wouldn't have been access to any 
religious activity. However, we must see that there must have been some time or another that Matthew heard Jesus probably at some public gathering where he spoke. And he probably heard Jesus speak about an issue of grace, forgiveness, love, acceptance. He had never heard nor ever will have heard any of that message from any of the Jewish religious leaders because he was a tax collector. But Jesus extended that to everybody. And what the words must have rung to his ear that God would love and forgive a tax collector. And so we see how he probably viewed himself, but great men in the church age viewed themselves that way. John Newton, who wrote the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. A wretch like me. Then John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said, I have fallen short of the glory of God who whole heart is altogether corrupt and abominable and consequently my whole life being an evil tree cannot bear good fruit. I'm so wicked. His brother Charles Wesley, who wrote over 6,000 hymns, said of himself, vile and full of sin am I. Paul, the author of most of the New Testament, said, I am the chief of sinners. Peter said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. If we get close to God, it's not that we feel like we're somebody. We find out that we're more nobody. The more we look at our life, we don't see that, hey, I'm really getting a little spiritual. <laughs> no, the more I look at my life, I see that it's only by the grace of God that my wickedness didn't demonstrate itself in behavior that maybe others may judge. Yes, we may look at, I'm not a murderer, but we need to say, by the grace of God, I'm not a murderer. And we see people in prison, we shouldn't say, oh, look at those people in prison. We say, but by the grace of God, my evil, sinful behavior could have manifested itself that far. We see people whose marriages are falling apart, people who are homeless and whatever, we should say, oh, by the grace of God, would I go if it wasn't for his grace that allowed me some kind of circumstance or situation that my sin didn't carry itself out in that behavior. But all of our sins are the same. <laughs> we should look at it that way. And it's the grace of God that Jesus doesn't see people the way they are. He sees people the way they could be and can be. And that's the way he saw Matthew on that day when he called him to follow him. Matthew must have been looking at himself the way all these great men looked at us. Oh man, I'm too wicked. I'm too undeserved. My level of depravity is too much. But that's usually not the issue. The issue to keep people out of heaven is saying, I really don't need God. I'm okay. My sin's not as bad as those other people. And if we feel about ourselves that way, we're really not motivated to follow Jesus. Jesus once asked Simon a question. He said, man, there was a lender. And one man owed the man 500 denarii. And the other man only owed the man 50 denarii. And the lender said, I forgive you both the debt. You with the 500, you owe me nothing. You with the 50 denarii, you owe me nothing. Jesus said, which of the two men would love him most if he forgave the debt of both? Simon said, well, the one who owed the most money. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Our motivation for the love for Christ to follow him is always based on grace. I owe him so much in dying for the cross, for my sins, if I'm alive and I have health enough to breathe, if I have a family, if I have a friend, if I have food on my table, everything I have, I owe him. And that's the motivation for following. That's the grace that he showed. And just a side note, that's the key to every good relationship is grace and gratefulness. And that's the motivation that we have, even if you've lost today, your motivation to follow Christ. You get it back, not by something external. You get it back by something internal, realizing how much grace God has shown and is showing in our life. The second thing, not only the motivation for following, but we're gonna look at the commitment for following. And that commitment is unquestionable obedience. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Matter of fact, Luke said it this way. 
Luke said, and he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. He left it all. Now this is a lucrative business. I'm not saying it's a moral business, but you could make a lot of money back then as a tax collector. You got that franchise, you made all that money. Here he is in his collector's booth. Who knows if he had people waiting in line ready to pay at that booth. Who knows if he had cash and coins sitting out on the table and he turned around and it says he left it all. Another thing it doesn't say is that he questioned Jesus. Okay, Jesus, before I follow you, what's this going to cost me? How much am I going to have to sacrifice? What am I going to have to give up? What am I going to have to leave behind? Lord, can you sign a contract here of what all this is going to involve before I commit to doing this? He had a blank check and said, I'm leaving it. I am going to be committed to follow Christ. Yes, part of salvation is praying for the Lord to forgive you of all of your sins, but I believe an aspect of salvation is a commitment to follow Christ. It's a commitment that we make in our life to follow Him. You know, there are phrases that we use about our salvation. Some people will say, I got saved, and that's okay. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And that's okay. I became a Christian. I became born again. And all those words are sufficient. However, what I believe describes the Christian life even better than that is, I'm following Jesus. Even though all those words can be present that I mentioned before, a lot of times people refer to them about back yonder. That's what I did back yonder. We're following Jesus is a question you ask, what are you doing today? Are you following Jesus? Because that's what the Christian life is. It's following Jesus. But you know, in today's 21st century, the word commitment is a word that doesn't go well. But the Christian life is the committed life. Let me say that again. The Christian life is the committed life. They're synonymous. I don't know if you realize this, but Philip Dutton's favorite dessert is pecanless pecan pie. You heard me right. It's pecanless pecan pie. I'd think he'd have to probably change the name, but that's another, that's another situation. But he loves pecanless pecan pie. I mean, he can make a fork spark when he gets in front of that pecanless pecan pie. Now what that means is, Philip Dutton likes everything about a pecan pie, except pecans. That's the only part he doesn't like about it. The rest of it he loves. And today's 21st century Christian, if you were to ask them to be honest, they'd say, I will really like the commitless, committed life. Now you can eat a pecanless pecan pie and there's nothing wrong with that. But you cannot live a commitless, committed life. What the Christian would be saying is, I like everything about the Christian life. The prayer, the anointing, the healing, the, the blessings, the church, the sermons, the singing. I like all that about the Christian pecan pie, but I don't like the commitment part of that. So take off that layer of commitment off my pie. But following Jesus demands commitment. Matthew, follow me. And he left everything at that booth and unquestionably followed Jesus. That's what it demands. Now, what are you going to ask me before I start walking with you? It's that whatever you ask me to do, even walking with you, is what I'm going to do. And then the result of following Jesus is compassion on others, and may I add specifically the lost that if we follow Jesus, we will have compassion for others, especially the lost. You can see what it says in Matthew 9, 10. Then, as soon as he starts following, look what happens. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? them scoundrels. 
Matthew doesn't say this of himself, but if you read Mark and Luke, some of the other Gospels, it clearly says this is his house. This is Matthew's house. I think he's a little too humble to say it. And in, and in other Gospels, it says it was not just a feast, it was a great feast. I'm sure Matthew said, you know what, I don't know what I can do now that I'm following Jesus, but I know one thing I can do. I got a house, and I got some money, at least he said right now, to have a feast. And I can invite all of my lost sinner friends over, and I got a lot of them because that's the only friends I've got. I can't hang out with the religious. They don't want anything to do with me. So all I got is sinners as friends. And if I invite them over, I bet I can invite Jesus over as well. And he can fellowship and he can share with them what he shared with me. And they can experience the love of Christ as well. Do you see what happens when you follow Christ? This will kick in. There will be ministry. He never took a class in ministry. He never went to seminary, but because of Christ living within him, he knew one thing, I've got to serve and have compassion on others because that's what following Christ results in is ministering to other people. See, in my flesh, my four best friends are I, me, myself, and yours truly. Those are my four best friends in the flesh. The flesh always wants to minister to those people. But in the spirit, it's ministering to other people is where following Jesus, where the rubber meets the road. And here, what he, that's what he does immediately. He begins to minister to them, those other people, the ones he can reach. And then he goes on to say in verse 12, but when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus said it's the sick who need the physician. If people die and they go to hell, one of the main reasons is gonna be is they'll say, I wasn't sick enough to call the doctor. You know how it is sometimes we just get sick and we don't wanna to go to the doctor. And we get a little sicker and we still don't want to go there. And finally we say, you know what, I think I'll go to the doctor. And that's how it is spiritually as well. People don't believe they're sick enough to go to the spiritual doctor Jesus to get well. To be freed from their sins, to be forgiven and pardoned and wiped clean. You know what, next time you go to the doctor, why don't you ask that doctor this, why do you always hang around with sick people? Every time I see you, you're hanging around sick people. He said, that's because I'm a doctor. That's who I hang with. That's my job. And that's what they were asking Jesus. He's saying, man, that's, that's who I came for, was the spiritually sick, the ones who need a doctor. See, a lot of people never come to know Christ because they'll say, I really don't see the need for Christ. And Jesus was making that clear. Matter of fact, he rebuked them with a, with a common Jewish rabbi rebuke, which was, but go and learn. Oh, don't you know that ate them up? They thought they knew it all as a Pharisee. And he told them, why don't you go and learn? Why don't you learn your scriptures? That I came to call sinners to repentance. And that goes to point number one about grace. Matthew knew how wicked he was. Do we know how wicked we are? We need the doctor. And even as a church, we're in all stages of wellness and sickness as we're at different stages of our spiritual life. But we're a hospital for sinners because Christ is the doctor. And all we can do is bring people to the doctor for spiritual healing to be made well. The fourth point is the reward for following. The reward for following is joy. Then the disciples of John, that's John the Baptist, came to him asking, why do we and the Pharisees fast but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. Why did Jesus use a wedding illustration to answer John the Baptist's question? Well, you know, John the Baptist himself said, I am a friend of the groom. That's the phrase he used of himself, which meant, I am Jesus' best man. That's what he was saying. Because the best man had 
in their culture a responsibility, and that was to prepare the way. His job was to make sure the young lady met the young man, they're like matchmakers, and make sure that they came together, they met each other, and then they could go on their courtship together. He prepared the way. That's why he said, I'm the friend of the groom. All my job is is just to bring them two together. Some of you out here are matchmakers. You brought people together, but once you brought them together, do you say, I'm going to go on your first date with you? No. You bring them together and you decrease and they increase. And that's what John did. He said those words. I must decrease while they, Jesus increases. Don't follow me. Follow the ones that I put you together. Because remember that day when he baptized Jesus, he said, behold the Lamb of God. I'm introducing y'all to the world. The Lamb and you, y'all need to marry. And Jesus goes back and uses another illustration of wedding and says this. You tell him, they're not fasting now because you don't fast while your groom's with you. There'll be plenty enough time for fasting once the groom is taken away because at the betrothal service, then the groom left for an undetermined amount of time, at which time when it's his choice, really the choice of his father, he would come back and get his bride in a wedding ceremony, just like Jesus will do for us. At an undetermined, undisclosed time, he'll come back and get us if we're ready and if we're his bride. And so he says, they're not going to fast because they're with me. This is a time of joy. This is a celebration. This is a wedding. And they are enjoying my presence. I'm their groom. When I leave, there'll be plenty enough time for fasting. But even when John the Baptist spoke about the wedding, being a friend of the groom, he used the word joy. And Jesus here is talking about joy. When you're with me, enjoy my presence because there's joy with me. There'll be time for fasting later. And then the standard for following. What is the standard if you're going to follow Jesus? I believe you can see it right here in Matthew 9, 16 and 17. Verse 16. But no one puts a patch on an unshrunk cloth of an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Now what is he talking about? Well, if ladies, if you or guys, if you have a pair of pants and you wash them over and over and over and wash and dry and wash and dry, they're going to shrink a little bit. Then if you take the exact same cloth that's brand new, it's never been washed, it's never been dried, you take that brand new piece and you say, I got a hole in my pants, and you patch that little hole with sewing material and that brand new piece of material. Then when you wash and dry it, the old pair of the garment doesn't shrink anymore. But that new patch, it's never been washed, it's never been dried, and it begins to shrink up and it tears and it makes the tear even larger. Then Jesus gives another illustration with the same point. Nor do people put new wine in old wineskins, other the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined but they put new wine in fresh wine skins and both are preserved. What's what's the meaning there? Well, first of all, he's saying this. It's the same principle. If you have old wine and old wine skins, that's fine. There won't be any more expansion and so it won't break. But if you put brand new wine in an old wine skin, then the expansion will burst that old wine skin. You better put your new wine in a brand new leather bottle and say, okay, How does that relate to me? First of all, to them, in the context, was to say to the Jewish people and their traditions and their rituals is that, look, don't try to add Jesus to what you're doing. That's what a lot of them were thinking. Hey, we got all the Jewish stuff going on. We got our traditions. We got our, we'll just add Jesus into what we're doing and that'll be great. And Jesus said, that's not going to be great. I am coming to be new. This is the new me. This is not the old way. This is the new way. And you're not going to add me as a new patch to your old garment. I'll tear it apart. And if you put me, the new, in your old wineskins, I'll burst that thing. I'm here to replace it. Not to put me in as a new add-on. And that application-wise, that's what a lot of people do in Christendom today. Wow. Wow. I've got my job and my hobbies 
and I've got my interests and I got my family and I got the things that I like to do and I got Jesus. <laughs> Life's good. No, it's not. It's Jesus as the center of the hub and all those other spokes in your life come out from that hub. Jesus is not going to be an add-on. He's going to be a replacement to say, I am everything. Let's put it this way, guys. You remember when you first met your wife? I mean, obviously before she was your wife. And you fell in love with her. And man, you think, wow, I, I met this girl. This, this is somebody I'd like to marry. But then let's say you just got through breaking up with this other girl who had some good qualities. Otherwise, you wouldn't even went out with her. But this person that you met who's going to become your wife, she's got everything. But a couple of things maybe this girlfriend had that this one did, but you're really not concerned with it. Then, then you get the greatest idea in the world. You think this. You say, I know what I'm going to ask my soon-to-be maybe bride. I'm going to tell my new girlfriend this. I'm going to say, look, honey, I love you more than anything. But I just broke up with this girlfriend, and I had a great idea. I really like a lot of things from her. And what we're going to do is how about I have a relationship with you, and I just add her into this new relationship, and she'll be part of us. That's great. I don't have to do replacement, just add in. And I have all that life has to offer. <laughs> it's good. Well, you'll get a good one of these right across your face. <laughs> It won't be good for her. But why do we expect that from Jesus? We will want to add him into our life. Instead of replacing everything, becoming first place, and everything else is kind of faded off to the side. That's what following Jesus is. It's saying, Lord, I don't want to add you in. I want to replace you. I want you to be the Lord. I want you to take over. It's kind of like those people that you're in back of them at a burger place, you know, and there they are up the line. I'll take a double Whopper with double cheese and double the order of fries, and I'll take a Diet Coke. <laughs> like that add-on, that little add-on is going to make all that other just go away because I did an add-on. And that's what a lot of people, they live their own life outside the walls of this church and consulting Jesus is not important. They'll just add on Jesus like a Diet Coke and think everything's going to be fine. And Jesus is saying, look, it's going to burst it up. It's going to mess it up. You may be familiar. Remember when Jesus spoke in Matthew 12 about the man in which the spirit, the evil spirit left out? He said that evil spirit left out of that man and was looking for rest outside the man. We don't know how it happened. The man, did he, the evil spirit get cast out? Did I, I, I got right? We don't know, but the evil spirit left the man. He was looking for rest. And the Bible said he couldn't find rest, so he decided to come back to that same man. And he said when he came back, the evil spirit did, he said he found it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Did you catch that? Unoccupied, swept up. I'm going to clean my life up a little bit. That's looking real good. Anybody got a dustpan? I'm going to put that thing in order. Get that furniture. Let's get that. That's... All right. Now my life. Doesn't have Jesus, but it's, it's unoccupied, it's swept, and it's in order. So this guy calls seven of his homeboys. He doesn't say it in the scripture, that's me, but he calls seven other demons to come with him. Seven other demons. Come on, guys. This guy, he's cleaned it up, he straightened it up, but it's still unoccupied. Come on, buddies. And the Bible says, the last state of that man was worse than the first. He added on. He didn't replace. You got to have Jesus. Just a New Year's resolution to unoccupy and to sweep up, put it in order. That's not going to work. Following Jesus is replacement, not add on. 
It's saying, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to commit all that I am to you and everything else will be second in my life. You will be first. I will consult you. You are the master. You are the Lord. I am following you. Not just adding you in, but be part and partial of my life. There was a girl born blind. And because of that, she hated God. She hated her parents. She hated everybody. She was bitter and bitter at everybody except for one person, her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was kind to her, considerate, loving, and encouraging. And one day her boyfriend asked her, will you marry me? And she said this, if I ever can see, if I ever get my eyesight, then I'll marry you. Well, one day, months came by, a donor, an organ donor had given a pair of eyes. She had the surgery. They took the bandages off. Things were a little fuzzy at first and then they became real clear. She began to look around the room and standing right to her right was her boyfriend. And as she focused in on him, she realized he was blind too. And so he said, will you marry me now? Because you told me you would marry me if you could ever see. And she said, I cannot. I could not stand now that I can see to be able to look at your eyes in that condition, the blindness there, and it would be a reminder for the rest of my life of how terrible that is. And I couldn't stand to see that type of scene the rest of my life. And second of all, I want to marry a man who can see so that he can enjoy life like I'll be able to and see the world. And so I can't marry you. He left rejected. He left in tears. Then, about a week later, she gets a card in the mail. She opens it up and it's a poem written by that boyfriend. And it says this, I just want you to know that I love you and I hope all is fine. Please take care of your eyes before they were yours. They were mine. And if that's not how Jesus feels, when we use every excuse of a blessing that he gave, to not love and follow him. Oh, I can't follow him. I've got all this money that I can vacation almost all the time. He gave it to you. Oh, I can't serve him. I got too many hobbies that he allowed you to have. Oh, I can't follow him. I've got more money. My education got me the greatest job on earth that he gave you that brain. He gave you that job. And we use the very thing he blessed us with as an excuse to not follow him. And must he go off in tears to know that we've done him that way. And so this morning, we look at following Jesus is our 2015 goal that I want to follow Jesus with all my heart, mind, and soul, whether I have and haven't in the past, I am going to from this day forward to follow Jesus. And I don't want any excuse but to follow him. What's my motive? Grace. Oh gosh, he gave me all that I didn't deserve. And he didn't give me what I did deserve. Requires commitment and unquestionable following. It requires loving others, serving others, loving the lost, compassion for the lost, reaching out to this world. It requires not adding on, but replacing. Not allowing any excuse, 
especially those that are blessings, to hinder me from following Jesus. Maybe this morning, you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus. You may have been baptized, you may have been sprinkled and confirmed and went through religious ceremonies, but have you ever made a commitment of your life to say, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus? Have you? If you haven't today, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, respond. Because you may not hear that voice tomorrow. You may be hardened. You say, well, I have made my commitment to follow Christ. But has it laxed? Has some of these factors of following not been yours? Maybe some of them have begun to fade away. Then today, even before this new year starts, you'll say, you know what? I'm going to recommit to following Jesus closer, harder, and further than I've ever done before. Maybe some of you are saying, you know what? I want to follow Jesus, but I haven't committed to serving him because I haven't found a church home. And maybe God has led you to this place for such a time as this. Because following is ministry as well. However God's speaking to you, we need to respond. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as you stand to your feet right where you are, is our...